A show provided by Low Rents. We lead. We find. You win. Anyone who's done much fishing knows that almost every time you get on the water, you don't start out on even footing with the fish. In his infinite wisdom, the good Lord intentionally gave the fish the upper hand to avoid being caught. And I learned early in my life and in my fishing career that if I was to catch many, I had to use every trick I could muster to reclaim at least some of the advantages. Our trip today takes us to the moving waters of the Tennessee River in search of the largemouth, smallmouth, and Kentucky bass. As we fish along, we'd like to share with you some helpful insights about fishing this productive waterway. Oh, it's a small mouth, too. Pull it, baby. Pull. A little cut up there, Buster. You're doing all your jumping now. Not coming. Ooh. You liked that curl bug, didn't you? Huh? Yeah, you did. Yeah. Pretty fish. Ah, gorgeous. Strong. All right, time to go home. Boo! Yep, no doubt about it. Of all the fish that swims, that one is my favorite. <laughs> okay, tell you what. Today, we're going to be traveling from place to place. And as we go along, we're going to be explaining why the areas we fish are so highly productive and why bass use them. We'll also be discussing the current, ideal locations, lure presentation, reading moving water, and what makes rivers so productive. Boy, he's run off in that deeper water. Come up here, buddy. Another little smally, just as strong as he can be. <laughs> Come here. Come here, you little tough thing. Easy. Easy. Boy, that will to live is unbelievable. Can you believe I can't get a hold of that fish? <laughs> He's been a little deep. Yep. See ya. Yep, this is a good little bait here. Okie dokie, moving along, it's important to remember, when fishing moving water, it's always best to position your boat, facing it into the current, and cast upstream towards your target. This way you can use your trolling motor to help slow you down and work the target or area much more carefully and much more thoroughly. Fish face the current. Now, by drifting and casting downstream, what happens is the current forces you to fish faster, missing productive areas. Plus, you'll have to retrieve your lure against the current, and this goes against the natural way that current delivers food to the bass. Coming right out in the current. Oh boy, get out of that current. <laughs> I love you. Let me just get my hands on you. Oh, they're pretty baby. Ooh, bait just about fell out. That nice. Great, great, great fish. Woo! Love you. See ya. Wow! Okie dokie. 
You know, as stated a minute ago, bass instinctively face upstream in a current to meet oncoming food. So when you cast, what you want to do is try for a head-on shot at the fish, if at all possible, as opposed to retrieving your bait at them from the rear or to the side. There's a wedge in front of the bass where the visual fields of both eyes overlap, which is referred to as binocular vision. Now, binocular vision allows them to zero in on their prey so they can strike accurately. Now, by bringing your lure to the fish, what happens here, it makes it easier for him to hit it without changing direction. By placing the lure along the side of the fish's eye, the fish may have to turn to bring the lure into binocular focus, but the line won't be moving across in front of him. And in a clear water situation, that can be important depending on your line size. What makes this river such a tremendous fishery is its water quality. And what makes its fish so healthy is the high protein forage they feed on. Now three of the most popular are threadfin shad, freshwater herring, and crawfish. And when you can duplicate that lifelike look of any one of these, well, you got a great bait. Naturally, you got to fish that bait at the right location, at the right depth, with the proper presentation. Now, with that said, let me show you what we're using today. It's Yum's new rig crawl bug, which comes in two sizes, a small two and a half inch version that weighs an eighth of an ounce and a larger three and a quarter inch size that weighs a quarter ounce. Now today, I'm going to be using the bigger one. Fish right there. Oh, they're bad about running right out into that deep. Oh, boy, that's a nice small man. Ooh. I'm out of there. Come here, pretty thing. I got you. Boy, that has been deep. That has been deep. Kind of gorgeous. He got the markings those others have, but he is pretty. See ya. Whew. Today's fishing journalistic looking crawfish lures. And you know something? These little critters are loved by all. People love them, animals love them, birds love them, and so do reptiles. And you can be sure that these critters really love them. Call him a crawfish, crayfish, crawdad, or mud bug. He's quite a delicacy to so many. Anytime you're fishing in heavy cover, what you can do to make this little guy weedless is to use one of these little stick guards on it. It's soft plastic. It's extremely weedless, but it doesn't affect your hook set. Oh, he's strong little rascal. It's got to be a small. Look at him. Here he comes. Go on, Mary Jump. I love catching these things. Come on back here. Come on back here, pretty thing. All right, easy. I see that big old orange crawfish hanging in your face. Now, it's important to remember that each river, big or small, is gonna have its own course, contour, speed, and configuration. But there are many features that are common to the majority of rivers you fish. The current flow or speed dictates the key locations of fish, and anglers should concentrate their time and effort fishing areas that provide some form of relief from the strong direct currents. And some of those places, most likely to hold bass, could be covered, located in the midstream of the riverbed that either deflects or slows the current speed. Okay, tell you what, let's look at a few. It could be a submerged treetop, a stump, boulders, a ridge or bar, a long point that extends way out underwater, or even a deep hole on the floor of the river. Places of this type give the bass the comfort of slower water and a super ambush point for prey as it moves by. You know, I think the reason I love moving water as much as I do is because that's where I got my first taste of bass fishing, wading and walking along the banks 
of the small streams and creeks in Middle Tennessee. In fact, today, I catch myself going back to fish these memorable little fisheries quite often. In fishing a river, it's not uncommon during the fall of the year for large shad migrations to move out of the main river system up into the tributaries. And when this occurs, it's very common for bass to follow. In recent years, I've had some of my best success in places of this type. What's really surprising is the size of the bass that can be caught there. So anytime you're fishing a river system that harbors shad and the water temperature begins to turn chilly, it's smart to check out the tributaries. Good night. You are a strong little rascal, you. Look at that. <laughs> All right, easy. Just want to show off, don't you? Open that mouth. There we go. Well, there we go. Nice little fish. Pretty colored job. Yep. See ya. In a river. Now here's a good one. It's where a ditch or creek enters a river. Bass will position themselves in the mouth of the opening to capitalize on forage from two sources, the main flow of the river and the creek. A point is another excellent location. It too will break the force of the current and turn it outward. Bass here will lie in the comfort behind the point and dart out to grab passing food or wait until forage works its way into the calmer eddy water. Small pocket dips or washes in the shoreline can hold fish for the same reason. Objects along the shoreline are also a good bet for a fish or two. But one of the key locations in moving water is eddy water areas. These counter current locations have slower reverse current movement and bass use them big time as resting and feeding areas. The swifter the main current is, the more predominant they become. They're set up by a change in current speed and formed behind a point at the mouth of tributaries in a bend or behind large objects at the water's edge. The thing you want to do is make this bait look as natural as you can. Just kind of hop in it. There's a fish got it right now sitting here. Yep. You just want to make it look as natural as you can. You don't want to overpower it. Let's go right out in that deeper water. That's a large mouth, or a huge small mouth, but I think it's a large mouth, yeah. All right, easy, easy. Open that big old mouth. You got that bug all down in your face. Get on back down the river. Okay, let me show you one more prime location. There are shoals which are found along the inside bends of the channel. In a river bend, bluffs normally form on the outside bend, which receive the majority of the current. Opposite the bluff, on the other side of the river, a shoal forms. Here, the down current edge of the shoal is usually best. The current is much slower and even slower on the lower portion of the show than on the forward section. And finally, the back end of the show, the bottom tapers off very quickly, dropping into deeper depths. Earlier I mentioned why rivers are so productive. Here's a few reasons why. The negative effects of a frontal system are not as drastic in a river as they are in a lake. Because of the more consistent quality of river water, Shock-producing temperature drops are very uncommon. Temperature changes are more gradual. The type of current is usually the determining factor in where bass locate and feed. Water temperature tends to be more moderate year-round in a river than a lake. And because of the mixing effects of the current level of dissolved oxygen tend to be equal from surface to bottom and from shore to shore. Rivers offer an abundance of high-protein forage. 
shad, herring, chubs, crawfish, pilgrimites, and insect larvae. Rivers have the right stuff in what it takes to grow bass and lots of them. Okay. <laughs> they get it. Oh, that's a strong one right there. They get it, they don't want to turn it loose. Oh, that's a nice small mouth. I saw him. There he comes out from the boat. Oh, pretty baby. Look at that. Isn't that a, that a great fish? All right. All right just say off for me. Stay off for me. Get that blade out of there. You talk about pretty fish. Look at that. <laughs> I admire them. Time to say bye. Bye. <laughs> so how about it? Give river fishing a try, but be careful. They can be very, very contagious. Thanks for floating along with us today, and we hope to catch you again next week right here on OLN. When we left last, Master Caster Tim Ray just was showing us how to use the double haul to add line speed to our cast, but I know you've got more for us. Well, when you use a regular trout rod and you use the double haul, you can actually generate fly speed in excess of 200 miles an hour. The trick now is to use that speed for you instead of against you. Now, I understand you used to throw javelin I did. in school. I did. Now, what's the secret in javelin throwing? Don't use bamboo, but you want to keep it on the same plane and then drive straight through to the target. Same thing applies when you're throwing distance casting. You want your right hand to track perfectly straight, drive straight back whoosh, to the target. Nice. So they're the basics of a long cast. It's not tracking straight. Just remember the last time you threw a javelin. When we come back in half an hour, Tim's two cents on landing your fly on a dime. I started out using the traditional approach of ripping huge topwater plugs called wood choppers. It was effective, but lots of short stripes and lookers. decided to have a second go at an extremely large fish I'd raised earlier on the wood chopper. I had a feeling my custom tuned Mag 14 Rapala would seduce this lure shy giant. This thing is a mule. This thing has got to go way over 20. Mm -hmm. Take a look. Here he comes up. Coming up. Coming up. Coming up. Come on. Quick, quick. Grande, muy grande.
Nope, you're not gonna believe this thing when I pull it out of the water. I would give anything if someone would explain to me the function of this little knob, you know, other than it looking up very sexy and everything. It's got to be for something. I know the males all have it. Normally, I would use a deer hair fly, but in this really, really hot weather, none of the floatants seemed to work very well. So what I did is made a diver out of a piece of uh, kind of a stiff foam, typical big fly fiber and flash of food, just like I'd use for pike. It's foam. I'm working it loud and fast, just like the peacock lures. That seems to be working.
want to catch some big peacocks, bait casting or fly rod, come out of the passimony. On occasion, there's a couple streams that we go to that they will come up to the surface and eat uh, these topwater dry flies. Um, they work pretty well here and there. This is one of the better streams for that. Um, so, what do you call that fly? That's called a polywog. A actually. polywog. Yep. Okay. Yep. And we fish them primarily in these two different colors here that you see, uh, kind of a bright pink and a chartreuse. Uh, we can start out with a bright pink. It does pretty well for us. So. Well, I'm real excited about this. Tell me how we're going to fish this. Sometimes they want it moving really fast. Sometimes they want it moved a lot like a popping bug. Uh, sometimes they want it swinging and just kind of slow stripping it. It varies okay. it up. So we'll kind of try a little bit of different stuff and see what works best for us. Tim, I see a few thousand silver salmon out there. I guess they're staging here, getting ready to run up this little coastal stream. Oh yeah, what happens is they come in here and they hit these big holes like this and they kind of hang out here for a little while, gather some more strength, make a push up, find another big hole, hang out, make a push up. And that's it's just a hole by hole process as they head up the river basically. I think enough talking, let's go catch a fish. Let's give it a try. Look at all these fish. That yeah. is just unbelievable. It is absolutely impressive. Right. Host Terry Gunn, who has Lee's Ferry Anglers on the Colorado River in Arizona, is being guided by Tim Holcomb. Tim works Alaska in the middle of summer. In the spring and fall, he's guiding his home rivers in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina and Eastern Tennessee. It's like casting a kite for sure. But, but there I we think go. that works just fine. Look at all those fish. There's a guy looking. He's oh, looking. He's looking. He's looking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he was that after was it. close. He okay. was after it. Excellent. Come on, boys. There he comes. There he oh, is. He's still on it. He's still, still on it. Nope. That was amazing. Oh, that was close. <laughs> that was incredible. That was pretty neat. Let's try it again. A little different angle here. Yeah, go for it. Great. Oh, did you see that big yeah. guy? Got, oh, there they come again. A whole lot of them came out looking at it that time. Yeah. You know, silvers are extremely aggressive fish. Yeah, they can be for sure. Seldom have we had so much action and not a fish to show for it. Terry had pulled out all his retrieves trying to entice a strike, even the hand over hand Barracuda Express. We'd been on the exact same river two years previous, trying to get the silvers up on a skated dry, and they wouldn't cooperate. Let's try the Barracuda Strip again. Here, oh, comes, there he here comes, 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 here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. When do these silvers first come into the stream in this part of Alaska? Um, well, it, it really even varies from stream to stream. I mean, streams just up the ways a couple miles here, it could be a week apart. But most of these fish start showing up early August and will sustain through sometime in September. We're, oh, there, oh, there he is. There he is. There uh, he I is. Yeah, that. that was incredible. He ate that thing with a vengeance. Yes, there wasn't that, any it, doubt about it. There was no doubt about it. He came across the side and ate that like a shark. That was an awesome take. So here we are, middle of September. Would you consider this to be prime silver season? And some of them are still getting fresh pushes of fish. So, um, like I was saying, it varies. But here, it's definitely as as good as it gets about now. And well, this river, these fish have been going for a while now. You, you it's pretty wild. You can catch fish that have been in here for a week and a half, two weeks now, and you can also catch fish that have been in here on a fresh uh, push on a high tide, so.
tell you what, I'm just going to get him up here and let you grab the leader. Excellent. If you don't mind. Yeah. <coughs> Slide him back. Just, there he is. Okay. All righty. That's pretty heavy leader. I think it's about an 11 or 12 pound leader. Yeah. Yeah, typically we use the bigger and burlier stuff. That is a nice girl. That is a bright, bright hen there. That's a big, big hen, too. That's about the top top of the scale there for hens. Well, that's a nice fish. Girl, go on and do yeah. your duty. Go on up there and finish we'll your We'll get business. her back. There she goes. <laughs> he gave us a little shower there, by golly. Yeah, right on the way out. They have a tendency to do that, get you wet. Well, let's see if we can do that again. When we return to Fly Fish TV, more pollywogs and silver salmon from the Alaskan Peninsula. Yeah, it is pretty cool. It's really, really neat just to see them come charging after that thing. Oh, man. Here comes one still. A whole wad of them made a motion for it that time. Had a little interest there at the end. Wouldn't want to be trying to cast this bug with like a five or a six way fly rod. I think this seven's just about perfect. Yeah, seven really is about minimal is with this wind. I mean, you can get away with a little less when it's not so bad, but seven, sevens and eights are about perfect for these guys. Seven makes them a little bit more fun. Eight makes it a little easier. Okay, just for the heck of it, let's change colors. Let's give it a try here. Oh, missed it. Got it. There she is. Things hadn't been happening fast enough for our duo, so it was time for a switch. For some reason, our angler and guide both thought pink might be out and chartreuse in. Well, most of the time, we streamer fish for them, using big, bright, ugly streamers, like these pink guys and the purple leeches. Right. Just any of the bigger, flashier flies with lots of marabou, lots of rabbit, giving it a lot of undulation and movement underwater. Um, that's typically the way we fish for them and the way I would say we probably do 90% of our fishing for the silvers, but occasionally we do try to fly, try to find a fly that does not work for okay. us. Okay, well let's hope that isn't one of these flies right here. <laughs> I hear you. I think we might be able to get a strike or two out of that one. Oh, I got my pliers there. <coughs> Man, there's a lot of char moving in there right now. A lot of fish moving in there right now. Oh, oh, there he nosed it. Oh, he missed it. He's still after. Oh, there he ate it. There you go. <laughs> that guy went after it like three or four times. Totally rolled up into that leader. I think yep. I've got this oh. fish hooked and hog tied. He's starting to unroll a little bit for you there, though. <laughs> yeah, about the time we get him up here is when he's going to decide to unroll. Now look at the big scar on the side of that silver. Probably from a seal or maybe a beluga whale. There's all sorts of different things, obviously, in the deep blue ocean that likes to eat on these things. Then when they get into the streams, they have to deal with a whole other set of predators, such as the bears and the eagles and all that kind of stuff. Grab him here. He really, that jaw really right. matures and rounds off like that. And uh, that's just like, like you said, it's a sign of the fish being in the fresh water for a little while longer. And they start to get this darker red color. You want to be careful with your fingers. They got some mean teeth. Once they start there, perfect. There we go. Look at that, the huge scar there, but the fish is doing fine. Yeah, oh yeah, he's still plenty fine. I mean, you find some of these fish with wounds even bigger than that, and they're still plenty healthy. I mean, obviously, if this guy's eating with vengeance like that, then he's he's not doing too awful bad. Go up there and finish your business, baby. There he goes. <clears throat> they seem Nicely like done. this chartreuse. Yeah. It didn't take but a, what, a cast or two there to get one. Cast or two, let's try it again. Oh, oh, there he is. Oh. <laughs> the hard part yeah. is setting that hook whenever the rod's under your arm like that. Yes. That's another good silver. Did too. a very nice job of it, though. <laughs> That's a nice fish, no doubt about it. Yes, indeed. Now. Is he going to go to the rolls again? Yep, that's a nice silver. Yes, sir. I believe that guy's a little bigger than the last one. I think so. Silvers on dry flies. I mean, that is absolutely incredible. I've heard about it for years. Yeah. This is the first opportunity I've had to do it. It's great. Yeah, it is pretty cool. <clears throat> That's a nice fish right there. That's a very nice silver. Look at that guy. 
a little wrapped around his Skype here. And the silver is the only salmon that I've ever seen that the, the top kipe actually grows around and down. Yeah, it goes down in front of the bottom jaw. Yep. That's a weapon. That's all about fighting. That, the males use that to fight off other males. That's yeah, a nice fish. They use, it's, but that's just a very, very nice buck there. <clears throat> it's one of the miracles of nature of these fish go to the ocean for several years and then return to the same stream that they, they uh, hatched out of. Yeah, they know? sure do. Come right back where mom and dad left them. Yeah, incredible. <laughs> Another shower. Tim, thanks a lot. What a day. That what a day. Awesome day. Good fishing. Good weather. Beautiful spot. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it a lot. Yeah, boy. When we return to Fly Fish TV, Tony Bolera ties us a polywog. By now, we were pretty convinced they today is Tony Bolera. Tony, like Terry's guide earlier, Tim, is not from these parts. He calls his home Tulsa, Oklahoma, where he spends a share of his winters crafting framed and show flies. His task today was to tie a polywog for us and to do it fast. He informed us fast wasn't something that was going to happen with this fly, so we had him do it at his pace, but we eliminated some of the repetitive steps. This is I get a little bit bigger. Now is it a three or four X long hook? Yeah, yeah, the shank is stretched out a little longer than your normal streamer hook, like okay. on a woolly bugger. Type of thread? Uh, 6.0. Uh, I'd probably go down to a 3.0 if you're having trouble when you're stacking deer hair. Let's start out here. with some, some marabou, just about as long as the hook shank there, right before the bend. And in addition to catching silvers, or silvers eating this fly, I've also heard that chums, chum salmon will eat this as well. Yeah, I've heard that too. I haven't uh, fished it for the chums, but uh, bass also, largemouth bass and some of the d different bass will hit it too. Terry, my next material, I'll use some flashy boo here. Gonna even it up with the tail there or I can slide it in a little. You can go with just one tail like that or you can go with two. I like the, using two uh, marabou feathers here. That way I can put the flashy boo in between them. Now we'll start with the, the deer hair and that's body deer hair, not the tail. And you wanna make sure you try to get as long as uh, deer hair as possible on the body hair here. It helps you out and you make a wider pattern or a bigger pattern. Once you get that hair, you'll see the real fine hairs in here. I'll switch hands there and then I can stroke some of those fine hairs out. And that'll help clean that up a little bit. You don't see them once you razor blade down. And here we're gonna stack the deer hair. Easiest way for me, I put it at a 45 on near side hook. Wrap real light around it loose there one time. Once you get to the back side there, let it go, let it spin. Then I'll wrap through it five to six times, 10 times there. And that's the first, first stack of deer hair there. Then I'll pull it back here. Okay, now we have that first wrap. I'm gonna go ahead, wrap in front of it. And then I'll do three whip finish knots in front. I'll start there, get my knot, and then I'll slide it over and snug it up. These first couple wraps, you really don't, are stacks of deer hair, you don't have to push back too far there. These stack flies take a lot of time. I can see why these things are a little bit more expensive than some of the other flies. You bet, you bet. They take a lot of time to, uh, to stack and pack the hair here. And that's why we fish them with a little heavier tippet too, so they don't come <laughs> off so easy. <laughs> huh? You bet. <laughs> now here, once I get a couple sets of deer stack or hair stacked there. I'll wrap in front and this is where I start packing it down there. You can use an empty pen casing to, al to also put around the, the hook shank there and push it down. The tighter you stack it, uh, the better that fly is gonna float so it doesn't absorb as much water, is that right? Right, that's correct. How many of these stacks are you gonna have to do to get this fly finished, Tommy? Uh, I would say right around 20. You can see how long it takes to, to fill up an inch, inch and a half hook shank there by packing this in tight. But it definitely makes it look a lot cleaner, a lot nicer. Stays afloat. There, and then I'll finish off with a couple half hitches here. As soon as I can get my deer hair out of the way there. 
And then right now I would add my head cement. We're not going to do it today, but I'll add head cement and then clip off close to it. And then in case of that, I clip it too close, it'll go up there and I'll glue it. Time to give it a haircut. Yeah, I think so. Take the razor blade here. You come in and you'll start going sideways, making a motion this way, not trying to push. So the top side's half circle, and then the bottom's nice and flat, so that'll ride real flat. And Tony, again, we would tie these two most important colors being the chartreuse, the other color being that hot pink or charisse, I believe it used to be called. Yep, yep, that would be your best colors out here. And I'm sure you could change up and put a little, uh, some orange or red, some of those bright colors, and we do well with them out there. Well, thanks. Next on Fly Fish TV, Denny Rickards examines his favorite zone in lakes and shows zone two is the one he feels most effective in. The second zone, folks, starts four to five feet down. Just remember that when you cast out, your fly is going to start here, but eventually it's going to drop down into that second zone. And that's not a bad thing. It is by and far the most effective, the most productive zone on most of the lakes you're going to fish around the country, especially the nutrient-type lakes. Okay, folks, we're on the Amzi Ranch property here on Hyde Lake, and this is a very prolific lake to fish. It's not a real deep lake. The area behind me here is probably 15, 18 feet deep, but most of the depths out on this lake are six to eight feet. So this is, for me, a zone two area. And so I'm gonna use Cortland's camo line for this situation. It's a clear intermediate, as we've talked about. And this particular zone, I'm gonna use small aquatic insects. But you know, the neat thing about this is we can use a lot of different flies in that type two zone. It is, without a doubt, the most prolific zone that you're gonna fish in any lake. That top zone can be tough when the fish are uptaking either on dries or or they're feeding on uh, small pupa. And it's because it's so narrow, that's a tough zone to fish. But we're going to start in that top zone and work our fly on down. But I have a lot of latitude as to pattern. I can use a floating line in this zone. I can use the ghost tip. I can use that six foot clear tip. But I find the most effective line for me is probably the, uh, the camo line, the clear intermediate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fish a small aquatic insect. I may go with a seal bugger and fish top and let it drop down. Since these fish, for the most part, are only going to be in that three, four, five foot area, I want to keep my fly at or above them. I'm going to use slow pulls if I'm with uh, the seal bugger or a woolly bugger type fly, leech, whatever you want to use up in that top zone. If I decide to run that fly down a little deeper and change my angle and bring it up, then I'll go either with my AP emerger or a calabeta snip, something like that. For most standard patterns, that would equate to a pheasant tail nymph or a hares or something. Just any aquatic insect pattern that's coming up. These fish will tell you if they're taking the mergers, but if you look in the water right now, at least as I'm looking, I don't see any aquatic insects out today. For the most part, I'm going to have to do some searching, and I'm going to do it with a camo line, and I'm going to use that slow pull. And here's the type of retrieve we're talking about. If I use a seal bugger or a leech pattern, something that is a bigger fly that can be fished in different zones, including type two. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this kind of pull right here. It's about a foot long, moving in this manner. Sometimes you wanna slow it down if the water's really cold. We'll do this. Make sure that you're holding in one spot, never drifting into your cast. That's a major no-no on lakes, remember that, because if you move into your cast, you create slack and it screws up your presentation. But this type of pull is very consistent with bugger and leech type flies. If I go to the small stuff, like a calabatus or AP emerge or something like that, I'm going to put the fly out there and I want to change the angle now. I can try retrieving up in that top zone, three, four inches, or I'm going to go down and let it get down a little deeper. And that means counting. With a camo line, it'll drop a foot in 10 seconds, and I'll count as much as 30. 30 seconds, and I do that for one reason and one reason only. I want this angle. I can use a ghost tip that'll do a better job, but the versatility of this line, I can move parallel to the zone. If I drop it down, I'll get those fish a little deeper, but as I get to the end of the retrieve, I have to come up to the rod tip, and then I get the angle that I want, so I'm anticipating the strike to come at the end of the retrieve, not early in the retrieve if I was up in that top zone. If you haven't discovered any of Denny's books or videos on still water angling, you might look for them in your favorite shop or catalog. He's brought a host of anglers to this enjoyable aspect of the sport of fly fishing. Fly Fish TV is brought to you by 
Fly Fishing and Tying Journal, a compendium for the complete fly fisher, a Frank Amato public... Cabela's, the world's foremost outfitter, brings you Americana Outdoors Saltwater Tour. The Saltwater Tour is also brought to you by Niemeyer Lures, Garmin International, Ranger Boats, still building legends one at a time, Yamaha Outboard Motors, and by Minkota Trolling Motors. Welcome to American Outdoors Saltwater Tour. I'm David West, and today we're in southern Louisiana, about as far south in Louisiana as we can possibly get. We're here as guests of Cajun Resorts, a beautiful lodge that sits out here on this marsh. If you can see behind me, it just goes on forever and ever. And we're here today, we're after some redfish. Now we're gonna have a lot of fun, so stay where you are. This is American Outdoors Saltwater Tour. Located in the country's premier hunting and fishing territory, Cajun Resorts offers a wide variety of waterfowling and fishing packages. The resort is located deep in the marsh, about a 15-minute boat ride from Golden Meadow, Louisiana. fun today in the marsh. You know, this is a nursery ground for most everything that lives in salt water starts out right here, including shrimp, crabs, your speckled trout, red drum, black drum, uh, just all your species, and uh, just a phenomenal place to fish and, you know, just to have some fun. Plus, it, it holds just tremendous populations of waterfowl. Some of the greatest duck hunting in the world is right here in these marshes. Phenomenal place. Yeah, I mean, this marsh is beautiful today. Let me just find some hungry fish. See what that fish was? Yeah, I just saw that. There's a good one. <laughs> There we go. There's a good red right there, Marty. Feel yeah. a little drag. Feel a little drag, you know, off my, my new little Daiwa reel. Boy, he hit hard, too. Yeah, he hit Just hard. Hammered it. That's a good fish. That's a pretty good Real one. Real good fish. spider wire, you ain't gonna break the line. Yeah. That's a good red. <laughs> a red ripper spoon right up here in the corner of his mouth. Isn't that pretty? Just one big old spot on him. Man, that's the size that, that eats good too, you know, just the right yeah, size. Yeah, the perfect eating size right there. Yeah. You can fillet them, block them, you can put them on the pit with that, that skin down. Basted whatever kind of basting sauce you like. <laughs> yeah, dinner time. Dinner time. All right. Like that feeling. Yeah. That's the feeling. That's why you come fishing. 
pretty good that bam, 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 bam. Yeah. And then everything just it's like the world stops there mm -hmm. for a split second yeah well it's just the excitement feeling that especially on big child you feel that oh yeah bam. that head that head yeah. shake that big head shaking under yeah uh, yeah mm -hmm. yes sir Oh, here we go. Oh, oh yeah. One. Now, this one keeps here. Yeah. yeah, there's a redfish. Ah, that's what I'm talking about. There's a redfish. Yeah, I can see the red. You see him, huh? See the red. <coughs> yeah, let me take the trolling motor. Can, can you handle him, Marty? I don't think so, dude. Huh? I might, I might need some help. Can you handle him? That's a nice yeah, fish. There's a pretty fish. Yep. There's a pretty fish. That's a good red right here. That's a good red fish. Yes, he is. Now you're throwing that green. Yeah, dark I'll, green. Uh, avocado with a red flake. Yeah. Now is that just a, a wintertime bait or? I tell you what, yeah, I use this all year long, winter and summer. Yeah. yeah. Now by comparison, what you know the plastic I'm fishing with is this pearlescent color. Mm-hmm. You know. This, I find that the last couple of years that this avocado with this red flake is. Very, very hard color to beat. Works. I'll catch redfish, trout, just like anything else. I mean, I, I carry other colors, but 70% of what I, I got is this right here. That's your confidence bait. That's my confidence bait. Now, this is uh, Gary Yamamoto's new introduction into saltwater bait, like that, which I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it here in a minute. Right there, Mar Marty. Oh. Bring him in. Oh, now I set the hook on this guy, so. Okay, now. We, we, need, we, we need to bet man a fish. Yeah. Now, I gotta go back to the boat. Going, is he going where he wants to go at? Yes, he is. Come on out of there. <laughs> Getting under the boat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Come on. Yeah. He's trying to get under the boat there. He's trying yeah. to hide. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Man, they're strong. Not a giant. Nope, that's a pretty one, though. But man, was he a fighter. That's a good, good keeping redfish right there. Good size to eat. Well, on that white grub, you know, on that, that Yamamoto grub tail, I just can't believe your fishery. You know, you have just, this is just phenomenal, the amount of fish that's in here. All right. I'm going to let him go. Go ahead. I'm going to put him back. Catch him next year. Catch him next year. Or maybe catch him tomorrow. There you go. All right. It don't, it don't get no better than this. Marty, it doesn't get any better than this. You're, you're absolutely right. I just said, let's say let bon temps roule, let the good times roll. <laughs> Berkeley Trilene. Daiwa Rods and Reels. And by Hat Eyes by Mag Eyes. Fish? Yeah. yeah. We, we have found a, a little hole here. All running about the same yep, size. All the same size. That's pretty typical for these fish, isn't it? You find. Yeah, you're gonna find like <clears throat> when you're gonna get into a certain size, you'll always find that they run the same size. How the juveniles kind of stay together. Yeah, Let's see if you can get, get that far. Juveniles, uh, they're all kind of out of the same uh, same age group. And they'll all hang around together for a while. 
as they get older, then they kind of kind of go out on their own mm -hmm. a little bit. You need those pliers. You can't even get him in the bone right there. Just a piece of skin left. There we there go. go. Yeah, why don't you put him back? And okay. We're gonna catch a couple more. <laughs> Better than your last one? He didn't know he was hooked there for a minute. <laughs> he's about like that, 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 that other one. I mean, he's a good fish. He is a dandy. Oh, that's a good one there. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Look at this guy. Look at him down there. I mean, that is a dandy redfish. Whoa, look out. He still wants to fight. We're going to catch him again. Still trying to fight. Hey, old Yamamoto. Right. Maybe we'll keep this one. You huh? want to keep him? Go ahead. All right, man. That's redfish. We call them redfish on the half shell. Redfish on the half shell. Fillet them, leave the skin on. Leave the skin on, barbecue. Barbecue. That's the right size. Cabela's, the world's foremost outfitter, presents From the Catalog. From Cabela's Spring Catalog, I want to reintroduce you to Food Savers professional two vacuum pack system now oh, right here at the boat fish on baby right at the boat you, uh, david are you gonna fish her david are you gonna cut that out <laughs> <laughs> oh marty man this is just look at that drag. are you gonna cut this all david yeah, this is it's just unbelievable you know this this fishery is just uncanny you know it's not a big guy but Still a fighter. Still They're a fighter. Fight. Look at that. They're very, very active right now. I think yeah, that's, that's the a, same that's fish. A pretty, that's a pretty fish. Look at that. Get out of that trolling motor, Ooh, everybody. Man. <laughs> These redfish <laughs> just never give up. Yeah, they just keep going. Look at that. That's, that's his tree. That's what attracts them to that. everybody. Such a fighting fish. And look at look uh, the spots he's got on him. Yeah, he's, he's got several spots on him. See the, you see how blue his tail is in that water? Yeah. Oh, that's, he looks a little bigger than that last one you just caught him. He is yeah, oh, yeah, he is. But he's not as mean as that other one. Just right there on the side of that mouth, just perfect place. Yeah, one, two, three dots on one side. Yeah, you got one, two up here. Yeah. And look at the look at the size of that dot. Yeah, that's and big as my thumb. And his back side's got the same thing. Two right there. It's a good healthy fish right there. Good healthy oh, fish. Man, just as strong as a weightlifter. Yeah. You know, the muscle of the. He's good fat healthy fish. Yeah. <laughs> He's been eating a lot of pistolets. <laughs> <laughs> There are two things you can be sure of at Cajun Resorts. You'll have a great time, and you'll never go hungry. This is a, it's called a, a stuffed pistolet bread. It's got uh, ground up shrimp and butter and chopped up greens sauteed and a little bit of cheese, a little bit of cream mushroom. You'll see in a minute. You're gonna love it. Cajun Resorts caters to the outdoor enthusiast who likes a little bit of everything. Great Cajun cooking, warm southern hospitality, excellent waterfowling, and, of course, exceptional fishing, all tucked away in the deep Louisiana marsh. Oh, man, just an incredible fishery. Incredible. Look at this. You want to stop that, Look at it. Stop? What do you mean stop for? <laughs> All right. Hey, that's a better one? That's a better one right there. He don't know he's hooked yet. We 
Look at this, look at this. Look, just incredible fish. Incredible. And that line sing. I love that song that's playing right there, Marty. You hear that? You hear that, that wind going through that. Dry, peeling off. That's a good red, though, David. Yeah, that's a good red. He hasn't even shown himself nope, yet. not yet. <laughs> okay, where do you want to go, buddy? He hasn't quite made up his mind. Just strong as he can be. Kick him all the way around. Oh, yeah. Look at the side. Look at them shoulders on him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Give me another pistol left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working them calories yeah. off, Marty. Now you're making, you're getting ready for lunch now. Yeah. Working yourself a little appetite. Yes, sir. That's a good fish, though, David. Real good. Oh, yeah. Look at Yeah. Out. Look at that fish. Nah, it's good. Look at that fish. And watch when you get him in. I've seen he's been hit by something. Has he? Yep. Look at this guy. Oh, man, he is heavy. See there. That's a good fish. Fat. Yes, look meat. at that. See his back where he was hit with something? Yeah, right here up here on the top of mm -hmm. his back. Been hit by something right there, that yep. big indention. Yeah, right up here on the top of the mouth. Tell you what, this little Yamamoto curl tail has been the ticket. Has been the ticket. Uh, that's a good fish right there. Yeah, let me see here, get him out in the sunshine a little bit. Yeah, look at that right there, right here on his back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's been some growling, you, you know. When he was younger, he just healed up. It could you be know, anything from a guard to uh, maybe a shark. Uh, tell you what, he's a survivor. I'm going to let him go. Go ahead. Let him go. You I mean, really want to let him go? Yeah, as much pain as he's been through as a, as a child, he him. deserves to live. OK, go ahead. Let him go. He deserves to live. He's, he's made it this far. Well, let him live some more. Information on how you could duck hunt or go red fishing down here in deep southern Louisiana Give them a call or go to their website. And remember, you can watch American Outdoors Saltwater Tour 24-7 at OutdoorAction.com. Oh, this bank looks good. Yeah, it does. Good. You know, I, I actually, when I'm red fishing, I actually love finding hard banks that they'll cruise up and down. Yep. But, you know, so many times you're going to be fishing inside a grass bed or something like that. But they definitely like to pin their bait up against a bank and crush it or race through and grab it. You're talking about working a hard bottom, a hard bank. I mean, that's exactly right. Because especially if you've got a hard bank like we have here and then you've got a drop off to maybe from two foot to three foot. They'll cruise that three-foot ledge, spy some bait fish up on top, and just get up there on that shallow flat there and just tear them up for a few minutes and go right back down. Right down, right. And like you said, they're moving all the time. Got him. There you go. Yes. I saw the minnow <laughs> scattering, and I felt, yeah! Thumped me right there. <laughs> he thumped you, baby. And I mean swallowed it. <laughs> Did he, he really? said, that's live bait, man. <laughs> that's what he's thinking. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That bait, Look looks, at it. that bait looks so realistic, they just want to chop it. I had, to, I had to chew it up. So what he did is he was in a school of shad, and I got to the school of, you know, whatever those are, those little, little bait That's fish. what they are, little shad, little pogies. And, uh, and it was just awesome because, here you go, buddy. Hang on. One more. Gotcha. And uh, that's a perfect size one there for eating. Just cool.
Hello? Yeah, he's grunting to me. You can hear him grunting? But he swallowed this thing. I mean, I'm just, I'm just jiggling. All of a sudden, I see all the bait scatter, and I lift it up. He's just smoking. Don't yeah. you think that's all relative to the way that bait's working? Yeah. The back of that tail is just constantly wiggling and swimming. Uh, there we go. It's just in the, in the crusher. It actually doesn't hook. The crushers are so hard, it wasn't even able to hook the crusher. You know, he was probably just, that's right, he probably just had it compressed he was on really the bait and was holding on to it. He was trying to crush the crab. <laughs> hey, little fella. There he goes. There he goes. You know, this stuff is so amazing because you can put a head on. You can see we've been using this a while and beat up the head, but it's got so much more action, so flexible, and it doesn't tear up. So you can catch just hundreds of fish. So we've on had it. a lot of bites on that bait. We've caught ladyfish, you caught the big garfish, redfish, Everything. and that bait still looks like it came out the package. Brand new. And still, look how good it's swimming there. It's perfect. But that's what's cool. You can use it like a normal jig on the bottom. You can swim it, and the tail action, you know, just picks up everything. So, I mean, you can swim this just like you would a spoon for redfish. You know, we've got a lot of water movement today with the wind. And that, that like you're saying, you work that bait slow, and just the water movement itself is going to flutter that tail and entice those fish to strike it. So, Mike, I know your personal boat's a 240 LTS. This is a little 22-footer, the 220. Why do you prefer the 240? <laughs> I wouldn't say that I prefer the 220, I mean the 240 over the 220. It's just that it's a little bit larger boat, and especially for what we do, guiding the guide business, gives us a lot of extra room and a lot more storage compartments as far as size, right. you know, to, to store things in. But you know what's really great about Triton? There's a lot of things that people overlook when they go to buy a boat. And it's the little things like the stainless steel uh, latches, the stainless steel hinges, and they swivel so that they can't get locked up and you can't crack that hinge when you, or a uh, latch when you're trying to close it. And, mm -hmm. You know, take a look at the wiring. Take a look underneath the boat. That's when you see where quality boats are really built. You know what? All boats sitting in the, the uh, boat stores stores are pretty. Yeah, they are. There's not an ugly boat sitting in the, in the lot, but when you start looking deeper, that's when you start seeing what boats are really made of, especially there's no wood in these boats. It's all right. fiberglass from transom to bow. And that's important when people are buying something for a long-term investment. That's why I like it. <laughs> Couldn't say it better myself. Yeah, there's a lot of activity here. Look at the bait down in here. Here we go. There's a red. Got him? Yes, sir. I got a lady. That's the real thing. the way it's pulling now. <laughs> it's not a ladyfish. Ah. I like the way it's pulling. Yes, I do. Look at this thing go. There's the dog. Oh, I like it. When you see that rod do that, big old head shake. I'll tell you what. Let me just turn this off, and I'll get on the big motor. That'll be the easiest thing to do. Just jump on the big Merc. Go after him. If he comes back this way, we're cool. With these seas, I feel like I'm fishing offshore. Come on, baby. Yeah, takes you over to this side. Takes you over to that side. He, he kind of goes back wherever, to this side. He kind of goes wherever he wants to right now. Golly, you think these fish don't pull? They pull. They're huge. Yeah, this this guy's huge. Now this is a little bit above average here. Mike, when you're fishing for redfish, what type of tackle do you like to use? <laughs> I'll tell you what, y'all. Over the years. I've changed a lot. Probably 10, 12 years ago, and I, if I was fishing down here at the mouth of the river, I'd probably be using a medium to medium heavy bait casting rod with 30 pound test line. But I've dropped down to light rods, light action, six to pound, six to 12 pound test line. And I'll tell you what, that's the fun part. It just takes you longer to land them. But I don't know if it takes like... you any longer, but you know what I like about the light rods is the sensitivity, because this fish really didn't hit it extremely hard. It didn't right. slam it. It just came up. And you know, mouth the bait just like the ladyfish were doing. Oh, look at, look the at the size one. of this pig. Now I wish I had a little more backbone, though. <laughs> <laughs> I so you I'd... still use like a seven footer? Absolutely, seven foot, even a seven and a half foot rod gives you a little more casting ability, especially when we're casting into this wind. And you prefer light and medium light, where I'm more of a medium to medium heavy when I'm red fishing. Light to medium light. I, I really, I, I don't use anything more than medium light these days as far as my rod action, but it's got to be seven foot long. Mm -hmm. Anything you know, less than that, because we're not doing a lot of flipping like the bass fish. We're doing close range presentation. We're making longer casts, looking for wakes on the water. 
Bring that little old minnow up here. <laughs> yeah, I got your minnow. <laughs> I got, I'm even gonna be so kind of let you touch him. Look at this big pig. That's an oinker. I am fixing to get wet. Come on back up. Just staying down. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, one more. No. That's a big girl. I got that dude. All that right. is a big girl. Wait, 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 wait. Don't do that. Don't do that, dude. No, don't do that. Come on back here one more time. I guess I. You know, us bass guys are not <laughs> real good at this. Uh, you're not used to wrestling with a 40-inch bass. <laughs> Come on. I don't want to lip him. That's a, that's a bass. It's just a channel bass. Yeah. Look at that red, huh? Hold on to him, Shaw. I got him. Golly, oh, what a fish. <sighs> that is a monster. Let me get my pliers and get this out. Now, notice you put a little, we went to a half ounce jig head because the water's so deep, and you put actually a little bit more weight on just to get it down. Only because of the current in this wind, Shaw. We're trying to make a long cast here, and the current's just beating us off. Look at this fish. Is that Where nice? Do you see this thing? <laughs> Is that not special? Uh, no, spots, what's up with that? Doesn't have a spot. Doesn't have a spot on his tail. He's getting so big it's stretched out. Here, he'd look better in your hands. <laughs> Now, they, they, I mean, being a 20, 25 pound or whatever, it, that's common out here on these things. Well, especially down here at the mouth of the river where the rock jetties are. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of fish down here that are, you know, between 5 and 15 pounds, but there's a lot of fish that are between 15 and 40 pounds. They're all working together, and it's just a, it's a matter of which gets the bait first. Man, that is one That is big one big redfish. Red now, we'll let her get her strength back a second here. We'll hold her about 30, 40 seconds, and she's probably just going to kick right out of my hand. Yeah. And that's important to let these big fish. Now, here in Louisiana, you can uh, keep one that big, right? You know what, Shaw? Legally, we can keep one fish over 27. Uh -huh. But a fish like this, this really is not good table food. Right. You know, they're very tough and very grainy and almost uh, a, a cottony texture when they're this big. And this is our breeding stock. These are all large females. And when they become this size, there's absolutely no reason to keep them. We, we right. release all these fish. And there he goes. Man, that's a good one there. Buddy, that's what I was thinking. There, there she go. goes. She kicked Hey, him. Mike, heck of a job, buddy. Turned him. Look at him. He's right there. He's got it. Does he? Yep. You do, Abby. <laughs> That's when you know you're desperate. <laughs> I'm very desperate to try to catch a garfish. We're having fun. We've only been fishing for 10 minutes. Ten minutes. I just got 10 the... minutes and we got to catch a gar. That's when the... you know you like fishing. There's no one in the world better than classic winner Kevin Van Dam. Fishing in the northern waters near Traverse City, Michigan, Kevin knows exactly how to coax these brown fish into biting. In today's first segment, Kevin will be fishing with Strike King's John Barnes, working with a variety of baits used for smallmouth in these clear conditions. In our second segment, Quantum's Jeff Moore and Kevin will discuss the various tackle that can be used for these techniques. But right now, let's join John and Kevin out on the water and see what we can learn today. Well, yeah, it is a good one. He hit it right here close to the boat. <laughs> Look at how fat that dude Boy, is. Boy, he is fat, isn't it? Come Let me get him for you. Yeah. I'm Look. talking about a pre-spawn beauty. This lake is so cold still. Look at that Look pig. how fat that fish is. <laughs> Golly, that thing's built like me. <laughs> Look at that black there, black birth marks on them. Oh, yeah. God, you know, they really always get that, tough. just like largemouths in the south, like Lake Fork and uh, uh, Rayburn and Toledo Bend, where they grow real fast and where they're, you know, healthy. You see a lot of fish You with see those a lot of them with the, that's neat. I like it. It kind of gives them a little different character. <laughs> he hammered that. Well, he sure did. I'm going to have to get your pliers. He got it right. Let me get him for you. I'll get him right here, right there in the holder. Now, that fish isn't that long, but he is wide. Well, he sure is. I mean,. This is this is my favorite uh, time of the year to catch them because they just they fight so hard. Oh. You're gonna kill me with those sharp hooks. Yeah. 
that that clown color is pretty hard to beat. I, you notice I put that on your rod? Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's already worked. That's a three that and a half pounder. And he, yeah, I think not even probably, what, 16, 17, 17 inches long? long yeah. You know, a lot of times when I go out, I have these preconceived notions that, hey, today is the perfect day and I'm going to catch them on a spinnerbait, for instance. And, you know, when you get out there, the reality is it's just not like that. You know, you see uh, one spot that calls for one situation and another spot that may take a totally different technique. So I've always got a whole assortment of rods laid out on the deck, rigged with different lures for different techniques for whatever I come across. I call it kind of junk fishing. I'm always prepared to junk fish. To throw one lure at one target, then totally set that rod down, look at another area, and use a whole different presentation. Yeah, Kevin, this uh, this is a big dark spot you found here. What what? Why are you throwing a jerk bait here? Just well, you know, because most of these are wood, and like this patch is, you know, 30 yards around. To cast a tube out there and and work it effectively. You just don't have much drawing power with it. Right. You know that jerk bait will pull them a long way. So I like to, you know, fan cast around with the with the jerk bait over those big areas like this to uh, to try to pull them up to it. You can make four or five casts around this and, and cover it real well with this, and, and that way you can move on. You know, yeah. when you got 20 miles of lake and <laughs> all that, you got to have something you can cover water with. Water with, right? Those two just seem to naturally go together somehow. Today, Kevin is fishing with Strike King's John Barnes in the waters off northern Michigan. Let's see if Kevin will teach us some of the techniques that he used to win several of his tournaments while catching his favorite fish, smallmouth bass. Confident, but oh. <laughs> oh, that's a nice one too. <laughs> Look at <laughs> now, you've been laying it on mine. You want me to get that one? Yeah, you can. You can do this. Yeah. Oh man, that was eight pound test now. <laughs> eight pound. Whoa! Pretty, pretty fish. They were jumping all over that bleeding too, weren't they? Well, early in the season, that's the crawdads up here, really, I like that. And that's one thing I'm always doing, you know, when you catch one, is you look down their throat and see if you, a lot of times you'll see a crawdad sticking out of there or whatever, and you'll see those pinchers are either going to be bright orange or they'll, they'll be that fiery orangish red right. on the tip. And uh, that's why I think this is such a good deal is with it just being that touch of red on it. Instead of the whole tail being red, it's just the inside. Oh, so. it's real subtle. That's right. It just kind of comes in from that inside and blends in with the, the main in that, color in the, of the tube. tube you know, the key to the tube is the way they ha they just have that erratic action. Right. Um, you know, when you, you can drag it, you can hop it. And with these cut tails, I mean, that thing in the water is moving. If it's if you're barely moving at all, it's got some action to it. It doesn't look like it had much action, but tubes are, without a doubt, the number one smallmouth bait up north. And with the fact that they're, that they're dip tubes rather than injected tubes, you can put so much more salt, salt in there. You got to. That's, the key, that's key is... The, to, to me, the number one thing about a tube is it's got to have a, a lot of salt and it's got to have those cut tails. Right. The, if the tails are sliced with the razors the way, like that, it makes the water flow over them. And I mean, you can see the difference in the action between a cut tube and an injection tube because a, an injected tube just goes through the water like this. The tails right. wiggle very little. Right. These are constantly just kicking and flowing, even if it's barely moving. Right. Well, I'm going to get my tube back. Yeah, I'd say it's a pretty good idea. They, they probably really keyed on the crawdads today. You know, look at how he mangled it. <laughs> <laughs> you think he wanted that red hook? <laughs> yeah, he, he got him coming and going, doesn't he? That's what I say. You know, you almost don't really need a trailer hook even. I like to have them with smallmouths just for insurance. But right. Just notice it's a red one. <laughs> Absolutely. I tell you, those red hooks, I, more and more people are, are believing that makes a big difference. Well, this and one's got red hook, red wire, red beads, red head, red in the skirt. That's called the, uh, that's actually a new bait we're building this year called the Premier, the Bleeding Elite. Bleeding Elite. We came out with the Bleeding Bait series of uh, spinner baits last year and we kind of stepped it up a notch with that red wire on there. And, uh, well, I like, I love the red hook. 
So well, the I don't know about the wire, but uh, that one didn't mind it at all. Well, I got to tell you, anything you know, anything a little different. Well, you know more than anybody. Anything a little different sometimes is the difference between no. generating a couple extra bites. I think the key is. Um, just on like on the red hook is that red wire it has flash to it it's not like red paint right and you know it just has that that flash to it it's just like the hooks on the jerk bait or on the spitting king it's that's what i want is i want that flash of that red on there right. you know that's a uh, that is definitely a strike cue to any predator in the water but and that little red tab on the blade I, don't yeah, know, I mean, nice. it, I like it. it. It adds another little bit different look and a little more of that red flash you're talking about. It has a glow to it. That's yep. what I like about it. You know, it's not something that you can just focus your eye on. I don't, especially in clear water. I don't ever want them to get a real good look at at what I'm uh, throwing. You know, especially with a spinnerbait, you want to move it fast, and with that, it just kind of has that red glow to it. I, I really like that. most important and confusing steps in being prepared to catch quality fish. In this segment, Kevin is joined by Quantum's Jeff Moore as they discuss the various factors that go into selecting the right equipment for the fish that they're catching today. Kevin, I think it was back in, in March, wasn't it, that we came up and met you guys at Table Rock and showed you some prototypes of a new Accurus reel and, you know, just got some in, uh, yeah, kind of the, the very first ones to be had and, man, it just worked out perfect after the E50 event that you've got a week off that we can come up here and, God, what gorgeous <laughs> water. Let's, let's I see might get to show you a small mouth, small mouth yeah. and uh, see what the new reels have in them. There's one. Got him? Jerk bait. Another jerk bait fish. Well, you know, it's hard to see. So when it's when it's hard to see, uh, it's, this thing covers the water so well. But when you can see one of those stumps out there, one of those trees laying in the water, that worm gets them out. Yeah, I see your tactics. You're on them on a jerk bait, and you got me fishing a worm. I understand. I got him. I let him go back and grow up a little bit gears and these sure make it nice to be able to fill that bait and feel every are these everything different gears than the other reels those are a new gear set in that reel yeah so we need to put the hurting on those you know what, what is amazing about this is how tight the anna reverses on this one that's what, it's, yeah it's a nice uh, nice really, solid when you set I mean, that hook solid. you just feel it yeah the jerk and baits are probably the toughest thing there is to well it's that it's that repetitive shock on the anti reverse system that really causes issues. You know, that, that one good solid thud, it's going to be there for that, but it's that little Every competitive, yep, the stuff you like to do to them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's real important to be open minded about your equipment, too. You know, when we, we had to fish a, a wide variety of lures to catch these bass, and, you know, I want to use the tackle and equipment that, that fits the technique the best. You know, I mean, for the tubes, it's just really hard to beat spinning equipment. You get, you know, really long casts with a seven foot rod and, and you get great lure control with it and they just handle the lighter line better. But a spinnerbait on the other hand, you know, with all the torque that they have, you need the strong gears of a bait casting reel. And you know, that high speed gear ratio helps you move that bait along a lot faster. So I, I wanna have the right equipment and the right action rods uh, for the techniques that I'm gonna fish, you know? And, and that's really important to maximize any technique. Yeah. Jerk bait. Jerk bait. Right over that dark clump. I'm gonna see you try to get it one there too. <laughs> yeah, I like that tournament fisherman. He <laughs> drops the rod when he jumps. How about that little guy? God, they pull, Kevin. Now let's see if I can do I this. I got one top. too. Got it double. Yep, up the same spot. Excellent. Uh, about the well, same size tough. too. No, nah, mine's got to be a little bigger. No. No way. <laughs> no, you got me on it, I think. Oh, wait a minute here. Who's got who? Hey, yeah. boy, I don't know if I'd brag about either of those. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what, though? There's no such thing as a small, smallmouth. They're, no. uh, 
God, they're all pole. No, they pull like crazy. Boy, they're beautiful fish. There might be another one out there. There's a whole school, apparently. Got him? Yeah. Nice small mouth. <laughs> Jump and shake. He yeah, thinks well, he's worm here. Look at here. Oh, man. That's the, oh, look at the worm is caught on his back. back. There it came off. It was caught on his spine there for a minute. <laughs> it was funny. He had it stretched all the way back there and caught. Beep. Not a very big guy, but gosh, mean. Still uh, just throwing that finesse worm around these big trees and stumps and these brush piles and that. It's it's easy to jerk that jerk bait over the top of them. We've caught a few that way, but they definitely like the the worm getting right in there in their house and, and shaking it. This The thing just has tremendous action and that's what it's all about. And I really like that. Uh, this one of my favorite colors is watermelon candy. And uh, that purple flake is, is real good. I mean, I don't know, I think a lot of the crawdads and stuff up here, they have a lot of blue and, and purplish look to them. So I like uh, tubes with purple flake and uh, this, you know, any of that watermelon candy, that's, that's real good. It's got the green and the purple in there. Another one out there. I learned last year that the smallmouth just tear it up. I Perfect. Mean, it's, it's one of my favorite things to use on them. There, there you is. go. Good nice fish. fish. Good fish there. I told you shaking that That's worm is deal, key. Isn't it? Boy, you're right. They can't eat that. <clears throat> they cannot pass that up. Boy, these are just gorgeous fish. God, they're so strong. <laughs> there's some there baby in them. <laughs> I guess you're here enjoying it. You don't get to do it as That's often exactly as me. That's exactly right. I'll get him for you. It's the least I can do. What you gotta do when the guy signs your paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> I better not lose him, right? Yeah, that's a nice one. Let's see if we can get him off. I mean, you had him hooked. He was there. He wasn't going anywhere. That's what I just call a bone crunching hook set. You wanna do the Good honors? Fish. Your fish? I'm happy to. All right. Beautiful fish. Bye bye. All right. Well, you know, like I was talking about before, these these rods are perfect for this. You, you know, for throwing uh, any technique, it makes a big difference to have the right action and length of rod. And for this finesse worm, you know, I like a seven foot rod up here in Michigan. You, we're you fishing want clear water for that, or well, for this clear water, I need length to make a long cast. But what I need is I need that tip <clears throat> action. You know, to shake that worm on the bottom, I want a, a soft tip. That's why we're using the medium action for this. You know, if I was throwing a, a big worm in, in 12 pound test line, I might want a and medium heavy, you up. know. But for this, I want something where that tip is gonna enhance the action of that worm. So, and these just have that real fast, you can see, most All of the bend in, in the this tip. rod is, All. that's what I've been asking for for years and you got, you know, that we finally got right is we've got these fast tapers in all these rods. That's what you need for every presentation. It helps you make a soft entry into the water. It gives your lures better action. I just see almost no need for really any technique to, to not have a fast tapering action. The only thing that I don't use a fast action for is crankbaits, which we got, you know, right. we've the, got glass the glass series rods for, that. for that. So this, these rods are perfect for, for this finesse fishing. Excellent. Let's go bend another one. Well, both John and Jeff had some good information for us, and we hope you learned a thing or two from Kevin on catching quality smallmouth bass. Join us again next week on the Pro Team Journal. And hey, everybody, and welcome to my kitchen. A lot of people love the taste of walleye, but oftentimes they forget that northern is just as delicious. So today I'm going to show you an interesting and really good tasting way you can prepare your northern pike at home that I just know everybody will love. To start this fantastic recipe, I'm going to start by squeezing the juice of one orange into the maple syrup. 
And now remember, don't throw these away because we're gonna need these in just a little bit. Then take your ma maple syrup and put it into a Ziploc bag. And you're ready for the fish. Wow, that time Babe caught some good northern. And just close it up and put it into your refrigerator for about a half hour to an hour just to marinate and get those wonderful juices together. Okay, now that I've got that out of the refrigerator, let's get the tin foil ready. We're simply gonna spray the tin foil. Now add our fish. Take fillets out and just lay them flat on the foil. Now you're gonna wanna add your orange peels that we've already sliced and then our crushed walnuts and just fold up the ends because we are going to use the leftover syrup and you just pour some of that in there and we are ready for the grill. I don't have the best day to be working outside on the grill so when you're doing this recipe I hope you have a better day but then again any day for this recipe with northern is a good day just place it onto a medium to high heat and when the fish flakes your recipe is done maple walnut northern pike for atlantic salmon and sea run brown trout came with one minor glitch the craggy terrain and persistent vegetation made conventional overhead casting all but impossible the ever pragmatic scots quickly arrived at a solution well, actually, you know, spade casting was developed over 100 years ago, and it was designed around great big rods, but that's somewhat of a misconception. Actually, any fly rod, doesn't matter whether it's a 7-foot, 9-inch, 2- or 3-weight, all the way on up to an 18-foot, 11-, 12-weight, can be used for spade casting. It doesn't matter what, what your application is, whether you're fishing for bonefish or permit, uh, fishing in the salt, you can use spay casting uh, techniques in order to present your fly. A pharmacist by profession, Steve Choate remains a fly fisherman by persuasion. In his home waters of the Pacific Northwest, East officially met West when a renaissance of spay-style casting blossomed around the mythic steelhead runs of the Skagit River. I got involved with uh, spay casting uh, about eight or nine years ago. I uh, got involved with scientific anglers and helped them develop a long belly spay line, which actually allowed me to go to England and do some competition casting over there a couple, three years ago. And that kind of led into uh, getting involved with the G. Loomis spay rod project that we started about a year ago. Fellow rod designer and longtime fishing buddy Ed Ward has equal insight into the theory and practice of two-handed trout hunting. Well, actually, spay casting in North America is a generic term and anymore. It's just as used to uh, describe any of the casts that use the surface of the water to make a change in direction. That would be underhand casting, skagit casting, or traditional spay casting. But if you use the term spay casting by itself, it's generally a very broad term to cover all those. Though spay casting originated in the highland salmon streams of northern Scotland, the same casting theories naturally translate to the big rivers of the Pacific Northwest, particularly in relation to the sea-run rainbow trout known as steelhead. Well, let him swim. And let him go, huh? Wow. Any species basically of rainbow can become uh, either a resident rainbow or actually go to the ocean, spend three or four years, become an adult, and come back to its home river and spawn. While two varieties of seagoing rainbow inhabit the coastal waterways, winter run and summer run fish, winter steelheading in particular has a reputation as one of the highest plateaus of the fly fishing experience. Winter steelheading is one of the toughest games that there is, and that's why some people love to do it. It's, it's one of the biggest challenges in fly fishing that there is. On top of that, you're fishing for a fish that uh, biologically, once it's entered fresh water, has absolutely no reason to feed. It's a challenge, and when you do get a steelhead on a fly, it's, you really feel like you've accomplished something. It's almost like a small miracle, actually. Known with both affection and chagrin as the fish of a thousand casts, winter steelhead require both skill and luck on the part of the angler. So the angler continues to probe the depths and continues. Ah! 
In the shadow of Washington's Cascade Mountains, the committed core of determined anglers thrives in the dark days and stark skies of winter, when a native run of ocean-going steelhead returns to the sky. On water as sizable as the Skagit, the luxury of a boat can mean the difference between casting for the sake of casting and casting to catch a fish. The most important is your location. You have to be fishing where the fish are. When it comes to the Skagit Valley, location can be practically synonymous with beauty. But when it comes to catching steelhead, beauty isn't everything. It also doesn't do any good to be fishing where the fish are if you don't know how to present the fly. Anyone who shivers through a winter's day in pursuit of these peripatetic bruisers comes to the same conclusion. Unconventional conditions require unconventional techniques. It's more efficient. It's, uh, you're not wasting a lot of time with false casts in the air. With a two-handed rod, you're able to throw the maximum distance that you're able to throw with your single-handed rod very, very easily. It's extremely efficient to be able to cover large expanses of water very easily. The main thing, in my opinion, is line control. The rods are four feet or more longer than a single-handed rod, and it gives you that much more length, gives you more line control for mending. And steelheading, the most important part of steelheading, as far as the actual technique goes, is line control. Controlling the speed of it or the depth of the fly, either one. Though wild steelhead remain the objective, the Skagit holds more than one winter winter. Ed happily puts the brakes on a different native. Not any bigger, just placed here. Little dolly? Yeah. Named for a flamboyant and flirtatious young woman in a Charles Dickens novel, the Dolly Varden is a close cousin to both the Arctic char and the endangered bull trout. I want to see it real quick. Pretty. That's a fat little dude. Though notable for its voracious nature, the brilliantly spotted Dolly is not the only predator making a living along the Skagit. The river corridor also serves as a primary wintering ground for a host of overhead raptors, including bald eagles, peregrine falcons, and red-tailed hawks. As many as 800 birds of prey occupy the Skagit Valley between November and March, surviving on the bounty of the river before heading north come spring. With so many hungry eyes peering down from above, it's no wonder winter steelhead take to the darkest pools and deepest runs of the river. The angler also represents a sort of highly developed fish hunter, one whose predatory instincts appear not in the curve of a talent, but in the arc of ingenuity. Spay casting first showed up here in Washington. Uh, we were trying to do that, but there wasn't any real proper instruction or books or anything to learn from. A lot of it was just kind of second or third hand information. And uh, after a while, what happened was we developed our own, own type of uh, spay casting. And mostly it was based on the fact that uh, we use a lot of sink tips and weighted flies here for winter steelhead. And uh, traditional spay casting, it's, uh, when it comes to throwing weighted flies especially, it, it's not real consistent. You can do it, but you end up using a rod that's so big that it outclasses the fish. 15 or 16 foot rod rated for a 10 or 11. Uh, that's a rod you can go out and easily catch 25, 30 pound canes on. Our average steelhead here in the wintertime is, if you're talking hatchery fish, they're only about five or six pounds. If you're talking wild fish, they're about eight to 10 pounds. So we'd rather use eight or nine weight rods and yet still be able to cast heavy sink tips and weighted flies. 
Though the roots of spay casting trace back more than a century, the enterprising steelhead anglers of the Pacific Northwest. Long before the first spay rod appeared on the Skagit River, the Northwest Coast supported an earlier variety of fishing enthusiasts. Native tribes like the Stillaquamish, Puyallup, and Swinomish basked in the natural beauty of endless salmon runs. The massive migrations of spawning cohos and chinooks made the arrival of winter steelhead seem a mere afterthought to the main event. Relying on spears and carefully crafted fish rooms, the tribes procured the majority of their annual sustenance in a relatively short season. An elaborate culture blossomed at the junction of river and sea, with festivals organized around the life-sustaining arrival of the salmon. While today's Northwest steelheading culture has a provenance of little more than a century, the arrival of the fly rod introduced old world sporting tradition to one of angling's great frontiers. As with any voyage of discovery, the spay casting renaissance charted widely divergent paths in the direction of the same ultimate goal. Steve Choate developed a casting mastery predicated on the long-bellied fly line well, counterpart Ed Ward cut his two-handed teeth on short-bellied theory and practice. While both techniques work well, they illustrate the level of experimentation characterizing the American spay revival. Casting is very important in steelheading. Uh, you really need to be able to cast consistently 60, 65 feet. Honestly speaking, most people, when they come out on their first day of steelheading, it's basically a day of trying, just trying to learn how to cast. The desire to master these casts soon spawned the Spay Days Clinic, organized by noted West Coast fly shop Kaufman Streamborn. Kaufman's manager, Jerry Swanson, brings a pool of knowledge from around the world to the steelhead streams of the Pacific Northwest. Our Spay Days event here came out of a, a very strong interest in the area in spay or two-handed casting. They all do things a little bit differently. I think that the people that are involved in spay casting are about as the most eccentric bunch of people I've ever met. Scottish style spay cast is a little over 100. I had a good party last night. To tell you the truth, when I was living here first, I was fishing with a single handed rod. And I would look at the riverbank and say, there are three spots where I could fish on this riverbank. When I converted over to Spay, I would look down the bank and say, I'm going to fish this whole bank and I'm going to love every minute of it. Though the prevailing objectives behind two-handed casting never change, styles and techniques cross a virtual spectrum. George Cook of the Sage Rod Company explains how one angler might apply different Spay presentations to divergent conditions. Today's cast on my agenda are the Snap Tea and the Wombat which is a new one in this part of the country. The snap tea has got a Northwest history and a Northwest flavor, if you will. It's a great cast for use with sink tips as well as floating lines. This cast works off the idea as a right-hander, it's a very strong cast, river left, which is what we have before us today. The cast has got two versions. The original version is an up and under version caster will raise the rod, come out, and accelerate under, which in turn places the anchor on his upstream side, which is precisely where you want it. The key to get the anchor point above you is to come up and under, but when you come under, you accelerate the rod, and it's that kick motion that puts it up top for you. From there, I'm gonna come around into the key position, and focus on that bottom hand pull, which is so common amongst all these spay casts. More pull than push. So up and under provides a great forum for a clean cast. Another modern variation can be found in the Wombat, a hybrid of the Snap T and the Perry's Poke. George demonstrates it as a recovery cast that can be deployed quickly with a minimum of wasted energy. In turn, the Wombat has become really a great weapon of choice. It combines the aspects of the snap T to anchor the fly up above. Through that method, here, 
combining with the Perry poke to set up a great perpendicular loop resulting in 100 foot plus casts in a straight, consistent manner. The Wombat will also work well for those who might struggle to place the fly consistently off the original Perry poke. Again, through the snap tee, I create my anchor, the poke, up, boom. One more time. Snap tee to anchor, pop it, poke, Though armed with an entire battery of spay casting techniques, the fly fisher sets out to impress only one critic, the notoriously difficult winter steelhead. Turn back on? Yes, we will. On any given day, on any major trout stream, chances are good that someone has an appointment with a fly rod. If the river happens to run in the shadow of the Cascade Mountains, and the month happens to be February, the appointment likely involves one of fly fishing's greatest icons. If you look at the people that are really good at what they do out here, they are very solitary. They're actually thinking about how they can, they can either change their presentation or, or view the water a little bit differently or try to determine a little bit better as to where the fish are holding at any given point in time. Each one of their casts, they're, they're thinking about how they're presenting their fly. They're thinking about where they're going to go next. Steelhead are definitely sensitive to light, in my experience. And uh, when you have a sunny day like today, it's, uh, it can be tough to get them in the middle of the day. Your best time is usually morning or evening. I think more than anything, it has to do with the brighter it is, the deeper they tend to run. And that's why it's tougher on a fly to catch them on a bright and sunny day. Whereas on a cloudy day, they'll run shallower water, which is closer to, you know, to the capabilities that we can get with a fly rod. There he is. All right, Eddie. Be in already. That was too cool, man. It's cold water, that's a do something. Just when you first feel that spark of life there and you know there's a steelhead, that, man, that's the best right there. You're just in all, just swinging a fly all day, waiting. Get to the point where you give up, actually, and then when you feel that first sign of life and you know what to feel it. It's like, man, that's what, that's what keeps you going. Ah, get out of the shallow water. When wild stocks of sea run fish began to decline in the late 19th century, wildlife agencies attempted to bolster the native populations of both salmon and steelhead through the use of regulated fish hatcheries. Now, two distinct strains of winter steelhead populate the Skagit River. While the hatchery fish provide one form of excitement, the wild fish arrive later and remain the hard won standard by which all others must be compared. Oh man, woo! Come on, hold on. Ah, there she goes. Oh well. Woo! Chrome bright, dude! A successful day of steelheading would be having good cast, just having a fun time. If you get a fish, then that's just super fun. Called the fish of a thousand casts for good reason, wild steelhead just might constitute the ultimate test of the angler's craft. When the fly fishing addiction runs deep as a cold winter's day, the Skagit beckons like the only logical fix. Get ready to cast. <laughs>